Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, I love talking about this stuff, and I'm very excited to share uh, the things I've learned with you. So, as um, as Devin said, I, I uh, was artist, the first artist in residence at uh, the Philosophical Research Society in Los Feliz, um, which is an amazing resource because they actually have a really wide range in their collection. Manley Hall was who founded the place in 1934. Um, his philosophy was you should be able to educate yourself about everything and figure it out, you know, what works for you. And as a result, he had Buddhist sutras, he had um, occult texts, he had alchemical texts. Um, Jung actually, uh, through correspondence, uh, studied, studied the collection there. Um, but it became a wonderful place to explore and do a lot of work um, that addressed different uh, belief systems and disciplines because it's all in one place. Um, and they were very kind in letting me uh, work there for about a year, not continuously, but you know, you know as a process, and, and work with uh, their collection. So this talk is Mandalas and Mythos over across art and time. Um, I'll tell you a couple things very quickly that you'll be noticing as I go along, and then one is that the mandala form appears in virtually every culture, um, independent of one another. And this was something that Jung uh, recognized, um, other anthropologists as well, um, partly because it's a circle. And circles are the most common shape that humans use to express wholeness. Um, so the quote I like to open with is by Neil deGrasse Tyson, which is, the universe is under no obligation to make sense to you. <laughs> Um, and indeed it isn't, but we actually spend a lot of our time trying to make sense of it. And we do, it, it addresses a few elements about us as human beings that are kind of interesting. Um, one is that we love patterns, and we look for patterns. And that's both a positive and that that's why our species has um, evolved and it's why we're still here. Um, but it can, we can also take it too far and go into paranoia where we find uh, patterns that actually don't mean anything. We think they do. Um, all of our beliefs are mental constructions. Some are consequences of other beliefs. Some are explanations built to explain existing beliefs and experiences. Um, Nelson Wilson, who, who wrote this for MIT, um, or a wonderful book called Understanding Beliefs, which I highly recommend. Um, but it is important to think that our beliefs are constructions at a certain point. And it's, some of this stuff is hard to think about because of it, it gets into how we actually operate and how we navigate the world. But it is fascinating to explore. So there's a few ways that we create constructions. One sort of sense is we're building continuous models of reality through the the, the, the stimuli we take in through what we can perceive, it's not entirely accurate. Um, one of the reasons that film, for instance, is shown at 24 frames a second is that it gives us the illusion of motion, which means that we're only processing that many frames. We can actually process a few more, which is why video is 30 frames a second. But we're actually taking snapshots rather than a continuous feed into, into our experience. If anyone's ever been in a car accident or been through a physical uh, shock, you'll notice that time slows down and you actually see more. And that's your brain really focusing on what's in front of you specifically so you can react. The irony for me is I, the time I most vividly remember it, I still hit what I was going to hit. <laughs> I just saw it more clearly. But <laughs> ideally, it was something that was going to help me uh, process it a little bit. Um, but there are approximations, and they're also a little bit out of date. Uh, there's a Vedantic monk that I, um, I've come, had the good fortune to get to now, and he is always saying, we think we live in the here now, but we live in the there then. And what he means by that is it just takes, just the time it takes for light to bounce off a subject and come to you, means that you're seeing it later. Now, obviously it's nanoseconds, um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the, um, phenomenon of looking in the sky and seeing a star that may no longer be there. The light's still traveling to us, but the source may no longer be there. Um, but it is still an interesting thing that in the way we perceive, we're always seeing things a little bit late. Um, and it's also important to sort of touch on in color, the color spectrum 
is 1% of waveforms and energy out there. And that's all we're seeing. Um, and if you think about ultraviolet light, that's already outside of the spectrum of what we can normally see. Um, another thing, I'm just gonna rattle off a couple of factoids here to sort of make the point, but if you think about, you know, we live in this age, this information age, where we have access to lots of information, and it's wonderful, um, but we still haven't explored most of the Earth. Um, we have not, we certainly not explored most of the ocean, for instance, um, which is most of the Earth. Um, we can go to Google Maps and things like that, but there's depths we haven't seen, there's creatures we're still finding. We think we know it all, but we actually don't. And in astrophysics, they talk quite a bit about the fact that we only see 4% of what's out there. Um, the other percentages, it's about 75 and 20, are dark matter and dark energy. These are things that they know are out there, but they can't find, they, we, we don't perceive them. And they can find evidence of it, but they haven't found the specific phenomenon yet. And one of the things I think is you know, a good way of thinking about it, bringing it back to Earth, is you don't need to see wind to know it's happening, you can see its effects. And I think that's how they're chasing dark matter and dark energy. Um, we tend to overlay information on the world around us. So we do so by language, of course. Um, we also do it via mapping. Um, we do it through mathematics. Um, we all commonly agree that Pacifica uh, exists here in this spot, and so that's why we all made it here today. But it's kind of arbitrary. Um, we've designated it as a, as a place, but there's no Pacifica ness necessarily <laughs> about this specific place. Um, I take it, I take that with a grain of salt, because of course there's a beautiful Pacifica ness to it. But um, it, it is arbitrary, and it's something we've assigned to what is. Um, and that order that we apply then becomes shaped by our beliefs. And so the way we refer to something, um, in this political climate, I'm not going to get into it, but you can see the power of language to shift perceptions of things. The way that somebody will speak about something changes the way you perceive it. And it's a very, actually a very excellent in instruction in the way that you give something a name and the way you refer to it changes how you perceive it. Um, one of my favorite quotes about uh, what we perceive too is you can't forget about our cultural conditioning and you know, Krishnamurti, just down the road in, in Ohio, um, would talk about how you needed to unlearn all these cultural things you picked up along the way. And not react from experiences you'd had before, but react purely to the experience in front of you now, which can be difficult. And it's an ironic thing, too, because I would argue that, you know, the reason that evolution has worked out for us is that we have learned from our experiences and make informed decisions moving forward. But he's also saying that you need to let, let some of that go if you want to experience pure reality. Um, but we do color it a little bit. And um, Werner Heisenberg had a great quote, which is, what we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of reasoning, which is a handy thing to keep in mind. Um, and as we move forward through the different um, images I've created and the kind of philosophies that I'm representing, you can see that the, you can imagine how the culture shifted around certain ideas. So we like to create order. Um, we see patterns, we find patterns, we create patterns, and we organize a perceived and intellectual world. Uh, the, the, you know, the, one of the things that's fascinating to me about not, us not being able to perceive everything is that we can't actually begin to organize it or think about it until we've figured out a way of, of knowing it's there and, of repeating the way of it being there. Does that mean? Well, the mic, but I'm not sure why. Okay. I think it comes down. Sorry. Maybe that's dark matter. Um, the, the, thing, the thing to think about is what is remains the same. And so, you know, what we say about a plant isn't the plant. The plant exists whether we look at it or we don't, and if we say something about it or not, it's still there. And that was another element that, that Krishnamurti would talk about quite a bit, is think about what is. Um, a lot of Buddhist and Eastern philosophy revolves around that as well. Um, ironically, having just said that, see, observing something also does change it 
For instance, when they observe particles, the act of observing them changes their patterns. And that makes them a very tricky thing to navigate. So seeing a thing can change a thing just as much as naming a thing can change that thing. So we like to order, and the way we order things most often is through a circle. Mandalas in particular. Um, the word mandala is Sanskrit for circle. And I became very interested in mandalas as interrelated forms and interwoven forms because it spoke to things that I thought were interesting in, in both Eastern philosophy and quantum physics. And where I feel where those two intersect, I'm jumping ahead in my presentation here, but um, maybe where truth lies. It's interesting that two, like a, a spiritual philosophy uh, and a philosophy um, and a science actually arrive at the same place. Um, Jung said that it became increasingly plain to, to me that the mandala is the center, it is the exponent of all paths, it is the path to the center to individuation. Um, and he saw mandalas in every culture. He saw it in Navajo uh, work, he saw it in, in uh, Pueblo Indians work, he saw it in European belief systems, he saw it in Gnostic systems, um, and he, he noticed that the idea of a mandala as a representation of the universe and as a circular form that uh, gave order to something emerged in every culture. So a mandala is first and foremost a representation of the universe. It's always circular and symmetrical. That's something that um, it leans back to our, our need for order and for a, a pure shape. Um, as I said, I use it as an example of a universal archetype um, and a symbol of individuation. Um, I think it's also worth bearing in mind that individuation is not just finding your own psyche and your own soul, but it's also in relation to other people. And, the reason I think that that's interesting in terms of Jung and, and using him talking about mandalas is that mandalas are a form that are, are is contained and it's a symbol, but it's also representing something that's incredibly interrelated. That, you know, there's an idea behind it that everything is part of the same thing. Um, the first example of one is an atom. This is obviously not to scale, but <laughs> if you think about an atom, this is what it looks like, and as you'll see later, Pythagoras, uh, before you could even know what an atom looked like, uh, chose this form as the monad, which was the totality of all beings. Um, where the images of atoms will share in their mixture of regularity and variation, the qualities of the dogs. And that was written by a quantum physicist named Frank Wilczek, um, who wrote a wonderful book called A Beautiful Question. And again, you see a, an idea between philosophy and, and science in the legal. This is actually a long-standing thing. Uh, scientists were originally termed natural philosophers. So it's not as uh, much of a leap as it may have felt. As I said earlier, you can see that the monad is a similar shape. Um, one is the first numeral is unity, but it is also the unity, the one. All oneness, individual, individuality, sorry, and non-duality, not a numeral, but a philosophical concept, an archetype, and an attribute of God, the monad. And that's you and Dad. So, an auspicious form. So, one of the reasons that I think that circles become very important and have remained important is that people would see them my pet theory is actually one of the first things that an infant focuses on is an eye, which is round, and it has a center and information radiating out from the center. But then, if you notice, um, that form repeats itself in nature. If you look at a tree trunk and the rings, that's the same form. If you um, look at a, a sun with rays, that's a similar form. Don't look too long. Um, it's, you'll see it again and again, and of course you see it in the heavens. So, in the cosmos, one of the things that I found very fascinating was you'd see in a lot of the star maps, obviously a center point radiating out, and that wasn't necessarily an accident. Pythagoras coined the term cosmos because it's uh, a word that meant order, and he wanted there to be an order in the cosmos. Um, if you've ever looked at a constellation and you look at the fanciful drawing of the archer riding a horse with, a, with his bow drawn, and you see the four dots of the stars that's supposed to be the constellation, 
it's very quick, it's quickly very clear that somebody has applied an order to that further than what might actually be there. But anyway, uh, Pythagoras coined the term, and years later, when Alexander von Humboldt created his treatise on nature and form, he resurrected the term from ancient Greek, and it has influenced the way we uh, perceive the universe as one interacting entity to this day. This is the cover of the cosmos. And notice that it's symmetrical. There's a center form. Um, so there's different ways of looking at it um, in, of the cos in, in, in the cosmos and the way it applies to us. And I picked a couple of different ways of looking at it that I think are, are interesting and taking you outside the box a little bit. One's panpsychism. This was a given to me by a, a meditation teacher um, at a lecture. Uh, the idea that everything has consciousness. There's a great article by Jim Holt in the New York Times about this. And the idea is that at higher uh, vibrations, uh, there's a little more of a sophisticated energy, and at more simple vibrations, there's less of a, of a sophisticated energy. That everything has consciousness. And I can say, as an artist, having left that talk, right, the world looked very different to me. Um, there's also the quantum theory, quantum and unified field, um, which is an idea that everything is interrelated, and also that there's a sense of oneness, um, which is. I, as, I, as I go forward in the lecture, pretty much every belief system touches on this, and I, you have to ask the question, sort of like the Heisenberg thing earlier, is this true or is this something we really want to be true? Um, there's interconnectedness and interpenetration, which again goes back to uh, particle physics and things like that, but also to Eastern mythology. Um, and one of my favorite uh, quotes from uh, Eastern mythology is, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, from the Heart Sutra. Um, which actually um, has borne out. They, they say that if, they, if we compressed, um, the, basically everything around us is empty. It doesn't seem empty, but it is. And that there's, there's a structure that makes it seem like it contains much more volume than it actually does. That if you were to take all of humanity and compress it to just the matter, that it would be about the size of a golf ball. Um, so form is emptiness, emptiness is form takes on a literal meaning as well. Um, this is, I jumped ahead earlier, but I, I, as I said before, I feel like truth is uh, likely to reside where philosophy, science, and mysticism overlap. Um, so, back to our mandala monad. This is uh, Pythagoras' monad, the totality of all beings, 500 BC. This is the Kabbalah. The uh, scheme of the four worlds. Uh, four comes up constantly in uh, ways of, of human um, creating information. And earlier today, I was at the uh, Joseph Campbell Library talking with the librarian there. He mentioned something about four, and I said, "Why is that?" And he's like, "Well, I guess maybe front, back, left, and right." And there you go. Um, and if you think about the, the four elements, uh, four directions, um, four comes up again and again. And a lot of times in the dolls will be quadrants, of course. This is the early, earliest depiction of, this, of the cosmos. Notice again, it's a circle. It's a never a sky disk. So 1600 BC. And already they're using a circle to communicate um, a wholeness and a universe. Uh, this would be familiar to most of you. Um, but it, I never knew that it was called the diagram of the supreme ultimate. I knew yin yang, but I didn't know diagram of the supreme ultimate. Um, and I. I love the idea that, you know, it's the balance that is key here. Uh, there's not just good, there's not just evil, it's a balance and it's constantly. That's certainly my experience of this word. Um, a classic mandala, now the universe again, four quadrants. Um, a Mayan calendar stone. This is one of Jung's. This is for his first actually done in 1916. Um, it's interesting, when Jung did the Red Book, which is, you know, a great number of mandala images appear in it, um, it was the, the feelings that, that, that were rising in him, and ironically rising in J.R.R. Tolkien at the same time, was this feeling of something of dread, something terrible was going to happen. And of course, it ended up being, in retrospect, World War I. But that really, that became something that, that um, destabilized Jung. He was really trying to find an equilibrium again, and mandalas for him were a way of doing that. 
Um, I'll show you a couple more here. And he, you know, as, as you probably know, he had his patients draw them. He drew them himself. Um, and the only reason he stopped was that um, Richard Wilhelm gave him a, a book, um, Secrets of the Yellow, the Golden Flower, and Jung became very interested in alchemy. Um, and that led him to moving on. And it's interesting, a lot of people ended up doing their main, a, a large body of work and then shifted to uh, alchemy, including Sir Isaac Newton, um, after he wrote the Principia, which pretty much invented classical physics. Um, he became obsessed with alchemy, and he thought that he would be able to figure out the, the key to everything through that. Uh, this is a Navajo a mandala. Um, I am in this conversation to, uh, to, to talk about mandalas both as uh, objects that you can meditate to and as circular uh, configurations of information. Uh, I know that some of you are a very uh, strict person about mandalas would say, well, if you can't meditate to it, it's not. Um, I'm being a little bit so I would argue that you can meditate to all of these. Um, this is a way Rosia, Catholic Rosette. Again, information from the center radiating out. This is from Islam. Uh, this is what he heaven looked like on April 25th, um, 1354. It's gorgeous. Um, the classic Enso. Again, all circles. And it pops up in pretty much every mythology. Um, myths are basic truths twisted into mnemonics, instructions posted from the past, <laughs> memories waiting to become predictions. That's Richard Powers in the overstory. Um, myths are really, are really a way we carry ideas around, and we're not aware we're doing it necessarily. There are myths that are so deeply ingrained in us that we view the world through them and are sometimes not even aware. Um, for a lay person, myth has a bad rep because it means <laughs> false. But as anybody, probably anybody who's sitting here knows, that's not necessarily the case. And it can become ways that we can communicate ideas and communicate, communicate you know, cultural um, cores. <coughs> Jung said, myths are the earliest form of science, which again I think is very really fascinating. Again, going back to natural philosophers as the early scientists. Um, it's interesting to read a book about the Royal Society in uh, England, which was really the first time that science began. And um, it's much more recent than you would think. It's the 1700s. It's not, you know, it's, 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 mu it's much more of a recent evolution. And if you start to think about where we are now, even in time, with the, the advances we've made, we're still kind of at the beginning. It doesn't always feel that way. Um, and, you know, obviously technology can feel very overwhelming, but we're still at the beginning. Why is mythology everywhere the same beneath the varieties of costume? Why indeed? Um, but you do find the same stories popping up in different cultures, and you see the same forms popping up in different cultures. Obviously, that's where I'm leaning, but you can't come to a place like Pacifica and not go to again. So, here we go. Back to the circle. A preference for circular shapes is deeply ingrained in all of us from birth. That's by Manuel Lima, who did a book called The Book of Circles. I did a big lecture at PRS full of, look, basically a, a longer version of what I showed you earlier, of different cultures, different forms, chemical diagrams, Robert Flood illustrations, sand paintings, all these circles. And I swear, like two months later, this uh, Manuel Lima published this book called The Book of Circles, which I highly recommend, which basically is that. It's he, he'd gone through all these things. He's an uh, information strategist at, uh, at Google, or was at the time, at least. Um, and again, I think the idea that the circle is ingrained in us, I do believe. One thing is that he actually uh, read uh, MRI data on people and found that circular forms lit up the pleasure centers more. So there is a very positive association with it, and it's, it's uh, you know, not just it's an emotional thing, but it's also uh, physical as well. Um, and again, I think it may be because of the It's also symmetrical, um, and we love symmetry. Um, and symmetry obviously appears all over nature. Um, we find it all over, and we, we celebrate it. Uh, I think a huge part of the reason we do that is because we are ourselves symmetrical, uh, and we look for it in, in elements. Um, but you can see in all these different uh, visions 
of quantifying information. Um, these are souls spinning around in paradise. Uh, this is uh, the path of Mars as uh, mapped out by uh, Johannes Kepler. Um, another thing I was saying earlier about how science is, is actually much more, a much more recent phenomenon than we think, Kepler's a great example. At the same time he was figuring out that orbits are not perfectly circular and are actually elliptical, he had to take time off to defend his mother against charges of witchcraft. So you get a sense of when, what he was emerging out of. Um, here's a more uh, recent way of, uh, of uh, collect, uh, arranging information. Um, Garrett Lisi is a quantum physicist um, who, who's creating an eight-dimensional model of the universe. Uh, the reason that they create this is that because they, they have learned that if you find an element and you can figure out what axis it's on, its corresponding element will most likely be in a place that's symmetrical to the first. It's the first place they look. And so the reason they're creating an eight-dimensional, I don't even exactly know how that works, I should, but um, the reason they're creating that is so that they, the axis can go in many different directions and they can actually map these, these particles to it. Um, obviously, there's a natural precedent for some of this as well, both in the heavens and on Earth. Um, this is the Icelandic rune. Did you know someone from Iceland to Iceland? Um, <laughs> But again, same form, center uh, element coming out. And obviously there's many variations within this, but it is fascinating. Uh, this is a somatic by Hans Jenny. Um, the original somatics were done by a guy named Ernst Schladny, where he would take a metal plate and rub it with a bow, and the forms would come out symmetrically. And uh, this, is actually done, this is actually done that way by applying vibration to a plate, putting sand over it. Um, you can also see these wonderful videos online where they do it with water. And when they turn the, the vibrations up to different frequencies, it gets more complex or less complex. Which kind of begins to sort of connect to the idea of consciousness, if consciousness is the vibration and there's different levels of it. It's a little woo-woo, but hey, we're Pacifica. Um, and actually, as I say that to make a joke out of it, one of the things I, I love to read, I don't understand mathematics super well. But I do love reading about physicists and science. Um, and look, there's a couple of interesting things. One is that some of the scientists didn't understand mathematics uh, so super well either. Michael Faraday being one of them. He's considered one of the best scientists of all time. Um, but also how the advances that actually have changed the way that we think and have actually led to advances that we all enjoy today came because people were thinking in ways that were completely counterintuitive to what the conventional mode of thinking so ideas like the continental drift, or ideas of like the, the, um, the theory of relativity, these were all ideas where they, they had they, you know, obviously undergone schooling and, and, and were well educated, but they were actually going into the woo-woo to find things, and it didn't, either finding things or finding a different way of looking at things to actually come up with a solution that was unusual and different and ultimately correct. So that's one of the things I, I just love about science and, and physics and that process. Um, circular Canon. Um, if you've ever played a piano round, this was a score that someone wittily put into a circle. Um, I love the way it looks. Uh, a diagram of Pleroma. We will get into Pleroma a little bit later with uh, Jung talking about it, because he considered it both nothing and everything. This is a diagram done by the Theosophists. Um, here's a tone circle done by John Coltrane for UC Latif um, to show the circle of fifths. This is The Long Player by Jem Feiner. Jem Feiner is in a band called The Pogues, or was in a band called The Pogues, um, but in his spare time he's an artist, and he created this uh, musical piece that will play for a thousand years. You'll see that the dates are 1999 to 299. Um, it's, a, it's an arrangement of uh, Tibetan singing bowls that are being struck, and you can actually, if you go online, uh, if you go to the Long Now Foundation, or if you go online to Long Player, you can actually download an app that will let you listen to it in real time. Not only is it playing for all this time, but it's not going to repeat a melody for all this time. So it's a fascinating project, and I love the fact that you can, if I wasn't using my phone to help drive the presentation, I'd, I'd start playing it. Um, sometimes it's actually a lovely thing just to have going on in the background. I think it's actually happening live across the, you know, across the world. It's in, it's in England in an old lighthouse. Um, 
And of course, I can't help but love the fact that in terms of showing the graphical information, the interface he chose is again a circle with information radiating out from the center. Um, you'll see this form also come out in contemporary information graphics. So here's an article in New York Magazine, When Genius Slept, which I can have some trouble sleeping and I love coffee too much. So I, of course, uh, parsed this through, but of course I love the, the graphic layout of it as well. But actually this is where I was, when I was saying earlier about the mandala uh, idea being strictly something that you look at and meditate to, this is a mandala. Is in that I look at this and sometimes I find the information is organized in this way, kind of abstract in a wonderful way, and my mind starts to swim and suddenly I am meditating. Um, and I find this with a lot of information graphics. This is the way that they uh, chose to show article popularity for The Guardian um, in uh, February of 2008. Um, the lineage of sin in the Bible. There's a project. Um, but again, that is so abstract to me, and again, we're not seeing it in size and in full resolution, that I, I almost feel like I'm looking at a pollock or something, where I'm starting to float through the information and go somewhere else. Um, this is the atomic diagram of gold. And particle paths from CERN. Now, another reason that I think the, the circle with the center with forms rating it out from it, think about a wheel in a car, steering wheel, um, is that it's also structurally sound. So this is the Large Hadron Collider at the CERN, and you can see this little guy standing there, it's um, huge. Um, but again, it's a circle, and it's because it's got structure, structural integrity. Um, this photograph was taken in, in 08. They're uh, rehabbing it for another go. This is another version of this, I believe, the rear view. Um, and also, at CERN, they had this statue of dancing Shiva, um, which I think is wonderful. It leads me to a wonderful quote by the author of the Tao of Physics. Uh, physicists do not need mysticism, and mystics do not need physics. Humanity needs both. I believe that to be true. So I was talking about the heavens and how information that we took from celestial maps has um, influenced the way we think here on Earth. And I found this animation is kind of wonderful about the dance that Earth and Venus do around the sun. And what's interesting about it is, as you see it, um, is it going? There it goes. As it begins to resolve, it actually forms the classic flower of life. I just love that. And I love the fact that something you might be drawing at a compass in your own home actually relates to a way that the universe works. Literally. I'm just going to let it loop so I can do the fancy dissolves of the actual final flower diagram. So there you get that. And then there you have it. So I'm going to talk about my work a little bit, um, and I prepared just a little chunk of the five pieces, or the six pieces you see over there. All of the source material is from the uh, Philosophical Research Society in Los Feliz, uh, which I highly recommend uh, visiting. And um, I want to take a moment here to thank uh, Kelly Carmena, who's the librarian there, and to thank uh, Greg Salyer, the president, for allowing me access to their collection. You know, when you say, when you, when you create forms that look like this out of ancient paper, wow. people think like, are you going to fold this? Are you going to crinkle it? Or, you know, it, there was a lot of trust that had to, to be extended to me, and I really, I really value that. Um, one of the, uh, these are not in order that I'm going to show you, because we threw this up pretty quick, but the first uh, book I'm going to discuss is The Private Instructions by Helena Blavatsky. Um, I don't know how much you know about Theosophy, I'm going to tell you a tiny, tiny bit, but basically it was an amalgamation of Eastern thought in, and a touch of the, of, of the occult. Um, Helena was the founder. Their, their uh, motto was, there is no religion higher than truth, which actually I think are in fact words to live by. Um, and as you can see, it was an amalgamation of different beliefs, but their, their own symbols have been 
Um, theosophy was hugely influential to artists. Um, and Pete Mondrian was hugely influenced by her. Um, Kandinsky, Apollinaire, Malevich, all of them were hugely influenced by, uh, by the, this work, and particularly as it related to abstraction. You have to bear in mind, these things were done in the 19-teens. So this is really, this is well before the American wave of abstract expressionism. This is the earliest baby steps. And it's amazing, first of all, how contemporary they still look today. But it's also remarkable that you can see, they were, they were inventing this. They were figuring this out. And they were trying to find ways to express emotion and the ineffable and, and things that you know, we, we sense but can't necessarily explain. And to do that, they actually turned to theosophy. Um, this is the image I've created from her book. Um, and I, um, I actually created, oops, I actually created uh, forms that were uh, numbers four, eight, and seven. Um, there's four main quadrants within those, those are eight uh, points. And then right here in the, in the center area, you see seven. And the reason for that is the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism, the Eightfold Path, and then the Seven Rays, which is obviously a big theosophical idea. Um, I'm going to quickly digress here. Uh, theosophy had a lot of uh, influence beyond uh, the art world. Um, one thing was, one element of this was uh, there was a law student named Mohandas Gandhi um, who went to London and he was approached by, they could tell him he spoke good English and he was approached by a couple of theosophists saying, hey, we're having trouble translating this, this passage of the Gita. We're wondering if you can help us out. And he was like, you know, that's superstitious nonsense. We don't really believe that. And they said, no, this, this is incredible truth. You, I can't believe you're saying that. Um, we think it's really powerful. We think it's really important. And Gandhi credited this in his biography with helping him realize that how colonialism had basically had him mistrust his own culture, be embarrassed by it, think of it as superstition and fairy tales as opposed to embracing it. And this was a bit of a wake-up call for him um, and led to him, his awakening, his cultural awakening and social awakening. Um, Annie Besant, actually, who was a theosophist who came up after uh, Blavatsky, named him Mahatma. She bestowed that sobriquet on him. She also, as you, as you may well know, found a young Jiddu Krishnamurti on the streets in India and groomed him to become the next world teacher. Um, he was uh, educated and venerated, and there was an organization created around him, Order of the Star. Um, and to his amazing credit, um, given the fact that he was pulled out of, uh, you know, given a lot of opportunities and, and feted and was an enormously popular speaker, particularly in Europe. Yeah, he, he, there was an annual conference in Holland in Holland where he would uh, give a lecture. Um, in 1929, he threw it all away. And he gave a famous talk, which I encourage you to look online. They have that at the Christian Murphy Foundation uh, archives, which is a down the street and B online, um, where he famously said, truth is a pathless land. You need to find it for yourself. No one really knows. Um, all I can tell you is you need to find what is. But you, the way you can find what is, is to peel away the cultural conditioning, your own experience, um, and really find a way of viewing the world as purely as possible. Um, he died in Ohio in 1986, um, and he had conversations with all sorts of people. There's a great book called Krishnamurti, A Hundred Years, um, where they show him talking, you know, interviews with him and Aldous Huxley, interviews with him and David Bowe, who was a quantum physicist, um, musicians, poets, writers, uh, mystics. He, he, he was really a curious guy and was constantly in dialogue with lots of people. And um, I, I think that's another uh, testament to, to him. He was very much against thinking separate in separate ways. He said, when you call yourself an Indian or a Muslim or a Christian or a European or anything else, you're being violent. Do you see why it's violent? Because you are separating yourself from the rest of mankind. When you separate yourself by belief, by nationality, by tradition, it breeds violence. So the other book, or another 
This book called La Materia de la Divina Comedia. It's not the Divine Comedy specifically, it's a book about the Divine Comedy, as done by Michelangelo Satani, who had quite a salon um, in, 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 uh, in Italy. Uh, he hung out with Stendhal, uh, Wad Wadsworth Longfellow, Franz Liszt, Henri de Balzac, um, it was a bit of a raconteur, and he self-published a book um, called La Materia de la Divina Comedia, and it's basically a book of maps of the different worlds that Dante describes. Um, Dante wrote the book in exile. Um, he got caught up in the midst of, um, you know, at that time, Florence was a city-state, and there were uh, various factions fighting, and he went off, and while he was gone, there was an overthrow, and he was no longer welcome back. Um, he was a politician and a poet. Um, ironically, he was banished under penalty of being burned alive, which is something that the guy who wrote the Inferno. Um, the Divina Commedia was actually, it's a divine comedy, I'll stop badly without seeing it uh, Italian, but it was a series of firsts. It was actually a radical work. Um, it was written in the Italian vernacular, um, not in, in, in Latin, and that's why it was called a comedy. There was tragedy, which was serious and written in Latin, and there was comedy, which was vernacular and considered common. Um, he, um, he's credited with created, creating the literature in Italy because he was the first author to write a serious work in Italian. Um, and he also invented the use of the Terza Rima, which is um, ABA, BCB, CDC. Um, so it's, a, it's an amazing work. The reason that Divine was added about 500 years later was because they wanted to elevate the work. Because it is. It's a major work. And they wanted to make sure that it was elevated and not just thought of as a comedy. Um, there's Dante in Exile. He longed for Florence. And um, anybody who's been there can relate. Um, but one of the things in the book, in, in the comedy, there's a, a refrain, I, I come from a place I'm longing to return to. And so when I saw this book, there's the furthest piece, this beautiful green, and it's got this lovely ivory paper. And I thought about the baptistry in Florence, where um, not only Dante, but the Medici's and Galileo were baptized. And as you can see, it's white and green marble. And then I thought of uh, this form by Doré, uh, which is called the White Rose Mandala by um, Anila Yaffe in uh, Men and His Symbols. And so I combined those two ideas into a form that had a white rose, had the color scheme, and then also was broken down into groups of threes um, and nines uh, related to the structure of the piece, because obviously the divine comedy is highly structured. The Bhagavad Gita, the book that the Theosophists are credited with uh, elevating back. Um, this is a really fascinating book, and there's a wonderful, it, it's actually been translated over 300 times, and on the occasion of one of the more recent translations, Harold Segal in the New York Times wrote a beautiful description, I'm just going to read verbatim to you, because it's a beautiful way of framing what the work is actually about. Um, imagine, if you can, a book beloved by Simone Weil and Steve Bannon, an apologia for war embraced as a classic of pacifism, a holy book admired by scientists. Thoreau took it with him to Walton Pond. Himmler carried a copy in his pocket. Whitman supposedly kept his under his pillow as he lay dying. Gandhi declared it to be his guide, as did his assassin, the Turo Godse, who carried it with him to the gallows. So it's an interesting book because the story behind it, Arjuna, the prince, is on the edge of a battlefield about to uh, engage in a, in a huge tactical maneuver, and the opposite side is all relative to him. And he doesn't want to do it, he balks. And so Krishna appears and convinces him, you've got to do this. And so it's an interesting book, because it's called The Song of God, it's embraced by pacifists everywhere, but it really is an apology for war. And one of the things um, that Krishna says, um, this has been quoted in many different ways, and the most famous is by Robert Oppenheimer, which I'll get to in a second. But basically, he's, Oppenheimer quoted him as saying, will I become death, destroyer of worlds? 
One of the, one of the lines is translated as, I am time, destroyer of all. And what he's saying is, if you don't get them, I will. They're going to die either way. So it doesn't really matter. And if you believe in reincarnation and you believe in an everlasting process, it doesn't matter if their physical form perishes now. This has to happen. Um, and I jumped, I, I, buried, I jumped into the lead a little earlier. But at the Trinity test, where Oppenheimer set off the atomic bomb and realized what he had done, he said, no, I've become death destroyer of worlds. And there's a very spooky clip of him on uh, television uh, quoting Vegeta. They asked him, well, what did you think? He said, I thought of the, the, the Indian holy world of Vegeta, where he quotes this line. Um, he was forever altered by that. He, real, he didn't really realize what he was unleashing until he had, um, which is in itself like the classic myth. Um, Prometheus. So the form I chose for this was something that was unfurling, um, and I wanted it to feel a little bit predatory, like a like a, a, an attack fish or something like that, um, or or, or bit, uh, battle banners waving, and I wanted it to have a nuclear component as well, um, because it, it, it's all those things. And I also wanted it to have a bit of solidity to it too, because it's a powerful beacon that. Has you know sustained things. It's influenced cultural change, um, but it is a very fascinating book. I've read a bunch of translations of it. I get something different out of it each time. It's a really remarkable work. Um, I also photographed a couple sutras. This was actually what got me in the door at PRS. I was mainly interested. I'd been reading these wonderful sutras, the Heart Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, and I had never actually seen the sutra. Um, and so I went there, and I, I, I knew that if I created a mandala form out of sutras, that that would be a powerful image, because there'd be this idea of representing the philosophy that talks about things being, in, being interconnected in an interconnected and cohesive way. Um, and then that expanded, because I started reading Jung and re learning that the mandala has popped up everywhere, and that it's actually not specific to the East. It's, it, there's a form of mandala in every culture. Um, Sutta or sutra is actually Pali or Sanskrit for string or thread. And the idea is that this should lead you to the truth. One of the famous uh, quotes I, I, that I love is of a monk who's approached by a student saying, who keeps referring to the book, and to the book, and to the book. And he says, why are you looking at my finger when I'm trying to show you the moon? The book isn't it. The book is the gateway. The book is the thread you take it there. Um, so the idea of thread, though, is obviously a very powerful one. If you're talking about Eastern philosophy, you can think of you know, weaving the threads of warp and weft intertwined repeatedly. The tantras are texts that focus on the interrelatedness of things. It's been used in Smith uh, in his description of the world's religions. Um, there's a yoke and weft. Everything's a fabric. Everything's interconnected. There's, everything is part of the whole. So with that in mind, um, I, thought the Prajnapar, I photographed the Prajnapar Mitra Sutra. Um, it's from an oral tradition predating writing. Most things are from an oral tradition predating writing. Most things were conveyed by songs, so the Bhagavad Gita is the song of God. You would sing things, you would create mnemonics. You saw me talk, use a quote earlier by Frank Wilczek talking about mnemonics as myth. Um, you would use all these uh, ways of, of reminding yourself how to tell the story, sort of the verbal memory palace, so that you could be able to communicate to people. And people who study cognitive uh, behavior have learned that memory has actually declined dramatically since we've had all this access to information right away. And I can tell you personally, I use Google Maps all the time to drive, and I, the other day I went somewhere and I forgot, I didn't know when to make a left or right because my gadget wasn't on. Just because I got used to it. And I'm, and I was, you know, I figured it out, but it was a little disconcerting. Um, so you can imagine if you're used to people saying things all the time, repeating things, and memorizing things. Um, there was a big uh, upheaval when you created the printing press, for instance. Um, but we do write, and sometimes the writing takes on beautiful form, and that's what the project is about, as well as the idea of, of uh, hinting at what was prior to writing. Um, the earliest extant print of the Perfection of Wisdom, which is the project of Gita's translated name, is 100 BCP. Um, the book I photographed was a Tibetan prayer book um, with fabric that, from the robes of monks. Um, 
through five, there are five layers um, that are meant to represent the five chakratas um, or celestial Buddhas. And my favorite quote is, so you should view this fleeting world, a star at dawn, a bubble in the stream, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, a flickering lamp, a phantom in a dream. The Diamond Sutra. The Pratyam Prabhupada actually contains the Diamond Sutra and the Heart Sutra and a few others. Um, and this is the form I chose to put it in there. Emphasizing the fabrics. And again, in multiples of nine. Okay, there's the Daihanya Kyo. One of the things that's fascinating about Buddhism and, and Sutra philosophies is the idea of translated back and forth and how it migrated from culture to culture. Um, this is the Sutra of Great Wisdom. Um, also includes the Heart and Diamond Sutras. So a lot of these things are basically anthologies. Um, and it contains the quote I used earlier, which is forms and endurance and what it is this form. This is, um, it's got 12 major shapes going around the outer edge. Uh, there's 12 steps of interdependent origination, 12 round steps of the clock, 12 comes up again and again. And I like the fact that it almost looks like a particle pattern itself. I had to do this one. Um, so, King David was a warrior, a musician, a poet. Um, and I started thinking about vibration, and that led me on a little bit of a rabbit hole. So, this is an alchemical drawing by Robert Flood. Um, another person that came to PRS that used to do a little bit of research there was Harry Smith, who, as you may know, created the anthology of American folk music, and he chose for the cover that Robert Flood illustration. And again, it's a center point with information radiating out from the center. There's a fascinating uh, thing that, that uh, Walter Murch uh, came up with. Walter Murch is a sound designer and an editor um, in Hollywood, but he's also a bit of a polymath. And David Byrne in his book, How Music Works, talks about um, Walter Murch figuring out that the Pantheon lines up with Copernicus's diagram of the celestial patterns. And that there's a theory called Titius Bode, which is the intervals between frequencies in a scale we enjoy relates directly to the orbits of the planets. Um, and this is an overlay of that. And there's actually information in, the, in, in Copernicus's uh, diaries where he talks about a, a lamp at the center or a, a sign in the center, and they realize he wasn't talking about the sun, he was talking about back to vibration. So this is the creation or the, the, the form that I created from that. And to me this goes back to the monad, um, which is again that atomic looking image. Um, vibration is a very powerful thing. Everything vibrates. And any quantum physicist, any physicist, uh, forget quantum, will tell you that everything vibrates. Um, as do many others. So nothing rests, everything moves, Everything vibrates. This is the third hermetic principle from the Kabbalah, which is a alchemical text. Um, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Think about Tesla. Everything in life is vibration, Albert Einstein. Um, which leads to another interesting idea that we that this work touches on and that you know, I keep coming up against in different philosophies and, and, and belief systems, which is the idea that all is one. Um, Tao is empty. It's used never exhausted, bottomless, the origin of all things. And so actually the Tao is shaped by the same. From one to all, that to be created. 
you're seeking a substance, something that stands under the appearances. But it may be that the whole reality has no substance. Perhaps it does not have an independent existence. It is in the field. And what stands under this reality is true. This is in conversation with Krishnamurti. I was telling you how he would come and converse with scientists. And there's a very famous book, of, or well known book, of his conversations with David Bowie. He says this. More recently, quantum theory has shown that particles are not isolated grains of matter, but are probability patterns, interconnections of an inseparable cosmic web. Jeff Kepler, the Tao of Physics. Nothingness is the same as fullness, and an infinity full is no better than empty. This nothing rudeness or fullness we name the Pleroma. It sounds like it's Eastern philosophy, and it turns out it's our buddy Carl Jung, um, who of course was in a stranger in Eastern thought, but it's a remarkably poetic, out there, form, you know, emptiness is form, form is emptiness kind of idea. Um, all the waters contain the and of course, I am he, as you are he, as you are me, and we are all together by another signature. Mm -hmm. um, the last quote I'll leave you with is um, a beautiful one by Jung that actually um, is probably the most poetic way I've, I've heard this put. It's a little, it's a little on the long side, but does a beautiful job. At times I feel I'm spread out over the landscape and inside things, and am myself living in every tree, in the splashing of the waves, in the clouds and the animals that come and go, in the procession of the seasons. There is nothing with which I am not linked. Which I think is a great way to view the world. And when you've had that feeling, you're walking down you're sitting somewhere and you're just feeling in tune with everything, but you can't read it. And so you can see why it's a very attractive idea. I think it's interesting that no one's ever really been able to prove it. It's something that we keep reaching for and reaching for. We're getting closer, and it may well be proven, but we're not there yet. Um, the last image I'm going to show you very quickly is um, of Jung's Red Book's Reader's Edition. I made a mandala out of that because the Red Book itself, obviously, is a famous collection of um, hand drawn mandalas. They were kind enough to create a reader's edition so you didn't have to lug around the giant tome. It has only like these black and white photographs with mandalas in it, so I decided to create one out of it. Um, so that the whole book becomes a single mandala. Um, I want to thank you all for coming and listening to me. Um, and I want to thank Devin especially for setting this up and Pacifica for letting me come. Joseph Campbell Foundation. Um, and yeah, uh, questions, please. Go ahead. Did anyone have the presence of mind to take this? <laughs> yes, this was taped. Is that available? Uh, Devin? It is currently being taped. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, don't know why, I don't know why I'm creaking and squeaking. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Can you move a little bit to that Oh, really? Now you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so it was taped. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, if you have any questions about uh, some, of the, some of the reference material that on here, um, if you go to my website, um, you, you, I have a, a section where I post stuff. And if it's not there, you can email me and I'll email you back. And um, what is your website? Oh, it's uh, <laughs> david-or.com. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to give a round of applause for that incredible presentation. Yeah, seriously. Um, and now, yeah, we have we have time to have Q and A, discussion, thoughts that came up. Please. Yeah, you discuss uh, how you made these this artwork. Uh, I read before we came; it was handmade and uh, and then enhanced. Can you talk a little bit about how? The process comes by. Sure, yeah. So it's, it's not handmade. What I do is I, I photograph a, a book and it, from, a, from a specific angle, and then I repeat that photograph, often by a number that's auspicious to that belief system. Uh, if I get stuck, four is pretty much auspicious in every belief system, <laughs> so we're kind of good. But that's why, for instance, Dante's is by a multiple of nine, those kinds of things. Some of these photographs are a couple different uh, 
uh, some, some of these images, I should say, are coupled with photographs of the same book created to balance out. Um, and what I wanted to do is, besides my personal belief is maybe that none of these belief systems necessarily ever got to the truth, and I include science in that, although you can rely on science as a provable function. I think it's still out there, and there's maybe a truth that lies beyond. There's a great Taoist quote, um, uh, the truth lies beyond language. Um, and I think that's a, a good way to think, to think about it. So I think it's why Christian these ideas are so powerful. All these ideas, actually. Um, but what I do have is a lot of respect for all these different systems and the ways that people, the incredible care and intricate thought they put into them. And um, that extends to the books themselves. I think they're beautiful. I, 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 I love books and I love uh, the different uh, manifestations they have. I'm happiest in the library. Um, and um, I wanted the images to reflect the physical qualities of these texts because I didn't know. I didn't know that someone took midnight blue paper and wrote gold ink. You know, that's beautiful. You know, um, I, I certainly knew about illuminated manuscripts, hence the title. But um, I wasn't I wasn't prepared for how different each one would look, and I wanted to really make sure that I could emphasize the specific qualities of each. Anyone else? Yes. What kind of paint do you use for your mandalas? Oh, they're, they're photographs. <laughs> you mean you don't design them? I, I, I mean, you have to. I do design them. What I do is I, I take a photograph of a section of a book and then I repeat it. So it's like Photoshop? Yep. Oh. Yeah. So you can play with the color and all that stuff? Yes. Yeah. Um, and then, thank you for saying this painterly. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that I do try to do is I try to make sure that the source photograph is actually a good photograph on its own. And I almost almost 100% of the time, I've noticed if, if the photo that I start with is good, the end image is good. It may not be 100% right for the philosophy I'm, I'm representing, it may not be exactly what I was thinking, but it'll make a uh, formal sense that it wouldn't if I just took any kind of photograph. So I really do try to have there be a richness to it, a composition, light and shadow. I mean, all the things that would make a good photograph, just in the little section I photograph. So that when it's multiplied, it actually has an integrity for lack of a better way of putting it. I'm trying to face this way now, so I'm just <laughs> Yeah, no, no. Yes? Um, how much trial and error and experimentation is there in each of these? Or do you, do you know when you're looking at the manuscript what the mandala is going to look like? Or? I don't. Um, and what's interesting, actually, it's interesting you ask that question with this particular bunch. So the second one from the left, which is the Psalms of the Sacred David, that's the first design I made. Mean. And I just, I, I tucked it to the side. I thought it was too easy. I, I think I figured I'll rephotograph it and improve upon it. I did rephotograph it. I did not improve on it. Um, and it ended up being the first one ended up going into the show and becoming part of the series. And it's actually one of my favorites. Um, others I ended up photographing a number of times. Some of the work actually I did not know the belief system, or I was not very familiar with it when I was photographing it. And I would try to make it an intuitive process where I'd photograph it from a formal standpoint, you know, when it treat me about the shape or whatever, and create a form out of it. And then I'd learn more about the belief system and be like, this doesn't actually represent that at all. Sometimes it did, which was great. Um, but oftentimes it didn't, and I'd go back and, and re photograph. Um, so it, it's, it, there's not one set feeling about how or, or, or uh, uh, answer to that question. Um, What's interesting to me consistently is I knew that, for instance, the blue paper with the gold ink would look amazing. I, it, it came out better than I'd actually hoped even. But I knew the color would be lovely. I wasn't expecting the, the, the form of it to look as nice as it did. Um, and that took a little doing because it was really a flat piece of paper. I wasn't allowed to bend it or fold it. or I wouldn't fold it. <laughs> but you know, some of it, you, if it's, if it's a, a bound book, you can actually curve a page over it. Itself. And now you've got a curve as well as a straight line. Now you've got a more complex co uh, composition you can photograph. Um, with a thousand year old suture, you're not bending anything. <laughs> it's just sitting there flat. And so I knew the colors would be nice, but I didn't realize, you know, it took a little bit of finagling with lighting and combining a couple different angles 
to create a form that I thought was powerful enough to represent the work. And actually, that's become one of my favorites as well. Did that answer your yeah. question? Okay. Yes? Um, the, the Song of David? What is it? Yeah, yeah the Song that's, of the Singer David. Yeah, as I was going through your website, that, that one's become my favorite, or my current favorite, too, it, because it has this ghostly quality to it yeah, as it well. Really good almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, And it was making me feel like these images really do have that quality of coming out of some kind of depth, if it's the depth of mm. space or deep water, or what I've also been just thinking about through your talk is the pupil of the eye, mm -hmm. and that kind of blackness, but which is also a, I think it's Alcibiades in the symposium, talks about that being the first mirror that we see. Not only do we see the eye, but we see ourselves. It's a convex mirror in which everything's pulled in. Yes. You know, if you can see that in the right light. So I just wanted to make that observation and, and wonder if no, you've thought about that as a mirror, too. I did think of it as yeah. a mirror. Now, it's actually, there's a reason I chose to use a highly reflective finish. I was wondering. So you can see yourself. Yes. In, yeah, so yeah. It is a bit of a mirror. And the there, blackness, too. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, the blackness was a couple of reasons. One is that that's how you would uh, photograph any artifact. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at those classic National mm -hmm. Geographic photographs of a statue or something, it's a, it's a, a way that it's sort mm -hmm. of a formal aspect. But the other thing I, is I did want it to become a shape coming out of the void. And yeah. that actually... It relates to the idea that you know we've, we've invented a belief system to explain how the world, how, how we think the universe works, right. and so the line that I use in the catalog is "sparks of thought in the dark." Mm -hmm. You know, and I feel like that's a really good way of thinking about it. Yeah, is that you know, it is what gives life meaning. Mm -hmm. It's the way we think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a great quote from Stanley Kubrick where he says that the most terrifying thing about the universe is not that it's hostile, it's that it's indifferent. Yeah. And then from there goes, we must create our own light. Mm -hmm. We must create our own meaning. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, for a devout atheist, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and there's a poetry to it. But I, that's definitely stuff I was thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> Jung has some attraction to that idea of sparks, too. I forget. Uh, what yes, he, he does, and as a matter of fact, yeah. I read you a lot during this process, um, mm -hmm. as you can probably tell. Um, <laughs> and I think that actually may have led to me writing that line. Uh -huh. like, uh, I saw that and I was like, ding! Yep. Yeah. 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 yeah, reading the Red Book while you're working on the Dallas is a yeah. whole solo <laughs> version. <laughs> Sir? So, are these available for purchase? On yes, your they website, are. On your website? Yep. Okay. Or you can talk to me. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I'm just curious, in your own personal experience of working with these numinous mystical texts, you know, and relating to them and photographing, and then recomposing them, you know, what's happening to you on a personal level as you're interacting with this work? Right. Well, if you feel comfortable talking about it. You no, know, I do feel comfortable talking about it. Like one, I, I one thing I touched on a little earlier is I, I think I became a lot less cavalier about belief systems that I didn't necessarily agree with through this process. So for instance, I went into it, as I mentioned before, sutras were really fascinating to me. I didn't really, at the time, think much about alchemy. But when I would see these, the, the care that was taken, and the, and the more I would learn about different belief systems and, and the ways that people you know, created meaning out of nothing, um, which I guess betray a little bit of my viewpoint there. Mm -hmm. but, there's a beauty in that. And so I would say that the way it changed me, it reinforced the idea that we do create something that overlays what is, as it were, but that there's enormous beauty within that. So actually, I mean, I was raised Episcopalian, and I decided you know, it wasn't for me, and I've been seeking, and so on. Um, what else is new? But the, the image that, that I actually do like is the Psalms of the Singer David, which is probably closest to my tradition. I never would have thought of that going into it. I would have thought, oh, it would be the Diamond Sutra or something that's talking about Andrew's net, because that's already intertwined. And it reminds me of quantum physics and things like that. Um, so I guess, in, in many ways, it, it's kind of helped me reintroduce to things that I thought of and maybe discarded. And it helped me explore things that were new 
and then have some respect for things that maybe I hadn't taken seriously enough. A cult actually was really interesting to me. So occultists were trying to find a way of blending um, realism and magic to find truth. And Elephus Levy was a was a big proponent of this. I never knew that before. I knew of Abracadabra and Abraxas, and I knew you know the the common occult ideas. But I didn't realize that it was a very sincere quest for meaning. Uh, Elphus Levy was actually um, in, in the priesthood and renounced it um, to, to, to follow his path. Partly because he fell in love and couldn't handle the, the celibacy aspect of it, but also because he had, a, he, had a, he had an intellectual break. And I was kind of surprised to find something that I had thought was maybe dark or manipulative or corny. Um, it had a lot of richness to it that I was not expecting. It was a much more earnest view. You know, you think of sex cults and, and black magic and all this stuff, um, and a lot of it gets a you know deservedly bad rap. Um, but I wasn't expecting that at the core of it, there's there's a, a true quest for something real um, and a lot more genuine than I would have thought. Okay, <laughs> you guys can follow me. Um, sir? Yes, I noticed that you talked about uh, three and nine uh, on this, and then you talked about nine and factors of nine in one of these others. The, the Prajnaparamita, the, the second from the right. Okay. Could you go into uh, what is the meaning or what symbolism? Of nine? Of nine. Sure. Um, well, there's a, there's a few different um, elements of it. For the for the um, for Dante, everything was threes and nines. There's the nine circles of hell. There's the Teresa Rima. Literally, the rhyme scheme is threes. Then there's three books. Uh, within the books, there's thirty three cantos in each book. So it's, it's constantly evolving from that. For the um, Prajnaparamita, um, nine is auspicious. One of the things is there's a temple where there's 18 steps, and each, if you, each step represents a layer that you cross to find truth. This is divided up by two, you get nine. Those were the kinds of things that I was, I was, I was um, exploring. It shows up right now. <laughs> <laughs>